Hello there, sword friends. Today I'm going to tell you about this sword right here. It is the Kita from Romance of Men. It has a longer name, but Kita is the part that I picked out. Anyway, before I get into the review of this sword, I do know a couple things. One, this is a review sample from Romance of Men. It was sent to me to review, to push, to failure if I want to do so, which I happen to do in this video. Uh, but I didn't spend any money on it. If you think that makes me biased, you know at the start. Two, uh, I do study Japanese-style swordsmanship. I practice with it as a practitioner a little bit. I can offer some some thoughts on the matter there, at least uh, for, for myself as a practitioner. But do know I don't fancy myself an expert in Japanese swordsmanship or in swords in general, though I have I have talked about them for, for a minute now. Anyway, uh, keep that in mind as you hear my musings and ramblings in this video. Uh, to talk about the Kita, what is it? Well, before I get into it, I should know the price. It's $188 as of the filming of this uh, video right here. So if you're interested, it will be linked in the description down below as well as measurements and all of that malarkey. Uh, $188 gets you a through-hardened Unakobi Zakuri geometry blade from the Romance of Men. And it's worth noting that the Unakobi Zakuri geometry is not... Uh, typically an inexpensive option, though there there may be competitive options out there. It's just not as common in the sub $200 realm. This through hardened blade as well is one that I've opted to push to failure. I tested a differentially hardened Unicobi Zakuri Geometry blade from Romance of Men. It's a mouthful there. Uh, that's one that means it has the wavy line, the hamon on it. Differentially heat treated means that it, it had the clay applied to it. It was dunked in some sort of uh, rapid quench material and it created the hamon on it. But a through hardened blade means that it's supposed to be a little bit more homogenous. And generally speaking, they're a little bit more forgiving. Uh, they don't necessarily hold an edge as well, but they tend to spring back into shape and uh, be a little bit more durable of a variety. So I thought that this would be a better one to test to failure. And that's that's what I've done in this video. And I'll walk you through the experiences that it took to bring it all the way to no longer a katana. All right, so as I typically do, I'll start with the fittings, the end cap right here, the kashra, the pommel, the bit at the butt of the sword, if you will. And this set of fittings is, first of all, embellished with a tiger on it, and the kashra prominently features Mr. Kitty. Now, it's supposed to probably be an aggressive tiger ready to pounce on its prey, but it looks like, it looks like a cute little kitty. And the casting quality on here is somewhere in the middle of what I think is good and bad. Now, it's a little muddy. <laughs> the fittings look like they are, are from a mold that's been used a reasonable amount, and uh, the, the quality is not great. But I can make out enough detail that it it's not so bad, particularly on a budget-level sword where your expectations have to be have to be managed a little bit more. And the kitty is, well, it's a cute little kitty to me. <laughs> it doesn't bother me, but uh, every time I looked at it, I just thought, Mr. Kitty. Um, Transition-wise, there's some improvement here. And realistically, this sword demonstrates uh, a big step forward for Romance of Men uh, in the sense that it was it was very comfortable to move around and the Ito, well, I'll talk about all the things, but there's a lot of improvements that I see here and I'm, I'm glad I get to share them with you. Anyway, the transitions, unfortunately, were not one of them. <laughs> so the, the transitions here did have some slight ledges. It could be done a little bit better. I don't know how much it costs or what it takes to get the ledges in such a way that they, they kind of line in perfectly or what the cost associated is to do that, but it seems to be a common thing missed on budget level swords. I like it when it's perfect. Unfortunately, this one was not. Uh, apart from that, I like the way the fittings go with the rest of the color of the sword. I'm glad they're not finger painted. It would have been very tempting, I'm sure, to apply gobs of paint on this little Mr. Kitty here, but I think this kind of bronzy look overall goes aesthetically well with the sword. And uh, apart from the transitions weren't great, it, it aesthetically, I think, looked, looked okay. Um, the other bit to note about the Kashra is that it came off relatively quickly. So I'll talk about it a little bit more when I get to the usage part, but Round about the first or second time I used it for EI, the Kashra came off. Uh, well, not quite in there, but it, it didn't take very long, I suppose is the point. Um, the Kashra came off relatively quickly in doing some uh, some stuff with the sword and a point where I, I don't think it should have. Now, if I had caught it sooner, maybe I could have, have done something and theoretically I could tie this stuff back on or do something, but the, the Ito is starting to, to fray so much that I won't be able to do that. Uh, some more adhesive, something a little tighter, addressing those ledges so that my fingers don't uh, push on them so much, all of that kind of stuff might help, but the, the Kashra came off. And I'll admit that this was a very disappointing sign. When the Kashra came off, I thought, oh, well, this, you know, <laughs> it's all downhill from here. But um, actually, the Ito still remained tied. I continued to use the sword with the Kashra off, and typically it just falls apart really quickly from there, and the Ito actually stayed stayed together, which is uh, which is commendable. Unfortunately, the Kashra came off, but uh, usually the Ito not coming undone was was a pleasant thing. 
um, which I suppose brings us to the Ito itself. Now, previous examples from Romance of Men have had really, really unacceptably loose Ito, and this is a marked improvement. Now, I can still move it. It can absolutely be tighter, but this is on the level of good for mass production swords. Now, what are you shooting for when you talk about Ito tightness? That's how tightly this cord is wrapped. If I uh, take this and push on it with, you know, as much weight as I can muster in my finger, it shouldn't move at all. That's really the goal. And is that fair to expect? No. Very few swords do that. It's uh, maybe a few from Citadel or Motohara are the only kind of production-ish type swords that I've had that have done it. Those are usually over $2,000. Um, I haven't found a sword in the $200 price point that does it. So this would be on par or good for a mass production sword around about the area. It didn't come undone and it didn't come unraveled after the Kashra came off. Apart from that shaping of the handle reasonably well, not too axe handily, felt secure and good in my hand. The Samigawa panels underneath here are uh, still fake Samigawa. I believe there's been some changes in, in future iterations. Perhaps there will be real Samigawa used on on uh, swords. I, I don't really actually mind the fake stuff, but if it's going to be fake, I would love to see a full wrap. I don't know why if you're using fake Samigawa panels, you would continue to use panels instead of doing a full wrap, which may add some additional rigidity to the handle and extra security, but um, I digress. It held together and actually didn't come unraveled, and apart from that, I can tell you that the diamonds and whatnot, they do wander a little bit, and when I say the diamonds wander, what I mean by that is the diamonds are different shapes and they kind of move in a zigzaggy pattern sometimes up and down the handle, but honestly not too bad. Overall, it looks reasonably well put together. Uh, thematically, there are Manukio in here that appear to be little bamboo leaves. I think they go well with the overall theme. I like that I can make out what they are, and I like that they're not some color that really pulls my eye one particular place, so thematically I think they did a good job here. Moving up to the Fuji right here, transitions are actually a little bit better here. I also see a Mr. Kitty. This one is a little bit muddier, but at the same time, I can at least make out what it is, and overall, transition-wise, it looked pretty good. The Suba. Some notable things about the Suba. Again, we have a very elaborate Mr. Kitty in a tree, running around, doing some stuff. Uh, the Suba is okay. I, I, I happen to not necessarily mind the theme. Some of the details on it are a bit on the muddy side, uh, but it's busy and has lots of little jagged points on it. Fortunately, none of which chew into my hand. I didn't notice any discomfort while using the sword from the Suba perspective. And I can also say that it's reasonably durable because I did, as, as I often do with these swords, chuck them at a tree and it hit Suba first and the Suba bent. And that's a good sign. Uh, obviously, it'd be great if the Suba remained perfectly intact and could chop the tree down instead of the Suba bending. But realistically, the expectations for these things are that they bend and that that would mean that it would absorb a sword strike and protect your hand from it as opposed to shattering or bending so much that you couldn't handle the weapon or something like that. This took a little bend, uh, which is overall pretty good for encountering a tree. Moving up from there, uh, we have the Habaki. This has a kanji on it. I don't know exactly what it means. I think somebody's mentioned once it was demon or something like that, but I, I, I'm not exactly sure. I like that it's embellished a little bit. It takes away from... Typically, these swords just have a standard brass Habaki, though. A, a tiger or something else, the, the kanji on here doesn't mean much to me. Uh, and thematically, I think it could be just a little bit different. That said, I like that it's not the standard brass Habaki, and it does all the things Habakis are supposed to do. It... Absorbed a little bit of shock. It's now rattling a little bit, but it hasn't split. Nothing bad happened, and tension-wise, it did, well, it was tensioned reasonably well, and that allows the sword not to fall out, and it allows, allowed me to use it as a tool for training and doing EI when, when it was still in one piece and I could do that. The scabbard has, I'm not sure if it's real or fake horn, but either way, it has little brown finish work for the Koiguchi Kojuri and Kurigata. Um, or yes, the Koiguchi, the mouth area here, the Kurigata, this little tab right here that holds the Sageo or this cord and the Kojuri, the end bit down here. Now, if the resin or actual horn, I'm not 100% sure, but I like that they're brown and it kind of ties things in with the other browns that you see on the sword. It came also with this yellow and black Sageo, which is reasonably long and did the job for me. And it's not cheap shoestring, but it's also not particularly elaborate, terribly expensive stuff either. It's got black gloss on it. There's some ripples in the surface of the uh, of, of the scabbard here, the saya, uh, but nothing that I would say is out of out of the norm for a sword in this in this price category. Uh, the 
Ito, or rather the Sagueo, is often tied down in a presentation knot, and it leaves impressions when it's tied down too quickly. I didn't see any of that here. I believe there were Shitadome on here, though, that were not tied in or glued down. Some people like it one way or the other. I simply take them off when that's the case, otherwise they rumble around and scratch up the side and whatnot. Anyway, uh, fitting-wise, I can also say that the side was reasonably fine to use uh, for EI. I was practicing with it, I drew it and sheathed it, it wasn't particularly loud, and I think it had some rattle in it, but not a huge amount now. It does, but there's only half a sword in there. So, uh, <laughs> I would say the, the side overall, what you get for the package, having at least some attempt at horn-like fittings, and that it, it fit together well is, is not so bad for a sword in this price point. All right, it's time to talk about the blade, the pointy pointy stabby part. And while this one is broken, it had some features at one point that are worth noting, namely the Unokombi Zukuri geometry. And what that is made up of is this fuller right here that runs about a third of the blade. Usually, Unokombi Zukuri blades have a soki or an additional fuller that runs uh, a little bit towards the tip. It's smaller and runs usually in the where the shinogi would be or where the, the edge or the primary bevel would start. And then the spine, about two thirds up the blade or for the remaining two thirds of the blade is tapered back drastically. Now it doesn't come to an edge, it's not sharpened, but it tapers back significantly. And usually these blades lend themselves to feeling light and lively. They don't have to, they can feel robust as well. There can be beefy blades at the same time. They often are a little bit more lively due to all the fullering and uh, removal of weight along the spine. Now this one does not have any folding, uh, so there's no hot up pattern in the steel. It also didn't have a differential heat treatment like the other one I reviewed, so there's no hamon. Uh, the blade itself is very simple looking. It's polished to a satin level, and I can make out some buffing wheels or tools or sanding marks and things like that on the blade. It's not done to a mirror polish, which means if you're actually going to use it, uh, some ultra-fine Scotch-Brite cloths or some light sandpaper will usually be able to get some of those scratches out and you're, you're not spending a whole bunch of money on a mirror polish that's going to be immediately diminished by actually using the blade. Uh, through hardened blades also tend to be a little bit more forgiving, so supposedly the edge retention is not as great. I've, I haven't found that to necessarily be super the case, but I guess they're, the edge is going to be a little bit harder on a differentially hardened blade. And if you're great with your form and cutting, then that edge might last a little bit longer. Uh, at the same time, the through hardened blades are a little bit more forgiving in terms of coming back to shape and springing into shape and not taking sets and bends as much. And that certainly was, was the case here. So uh, feature-wise on the blade, it's more or less the geometry, which was done reasonably well. Now there, there's telltale signs that are not great here. The fullers are not terminated perfectly in the same spot. If I look at this grind line, it, it's one side is steeper than the other, as was near the Kasaki. But, Overall, it's still the vast majority of the shape, and you get the idea from a distance, um, even though it's not super well executed. But again, a $200 price point, I'm not, I'm not expecting a whole lot. Uh, but the main point was the geometry. There's not much else to talk about on the blade in terms of features. In terms of moving it around as a practitioner, would be the next thing I can talk about. And more or less on the practitioner side, it drew and was fine. The Ito was tight. None of the typical things that bother me about swords uh, were problematic here. It was an okay tool. Now, it's not as good as an Eito from Japan, specifically built to do EI, but uh, as a training tool, if you're looking to practice with something, it did all the things that I could really hope for in a $200 Shenkin. The Ito was reasonably tight, and the uh, the draw and sheath was okay. The main culprit was that uh, the Kashra came off after what I would say is, is too soon, which would mean that if you want to apply a little bit of adhesive, if you get one of these or something like that, then that would likely keep the Kashra on and it wouldn't come off. Um, unfortunately, the Kashra did come off. That's really the only thing that was problematic. Apart from that, moving it around, uh, practicing with it, I could hear it as I swung it, and it was overall a reasonably comfortable experience doing that. In terms of actually cutting things, it also did really well. It came with a really nice, keen edge, and it popped pool noodles apart, it cut water bottles, the edge held up reasonably well, it whacked the neck of some bottles, which are pretty thick plastic, I didn't notice any edge deflection, and cutting some harder targets as well. Obviously, those targets would, uh, would be cut. This is a lighter sword, so I did have to swing pretty hard when it came to some very robust targets, but overall, I would say it held up really well, and it also cut really well. I've also had a few different cutting events at my house, wherein there's an assortment you might say of swords to pick from and this tended to be one of the ones that was gravitated towards whether it be 
folks like myself that just wanted to cut pool noodles and pop them apart and, and because it was easy and it worked really well, uh, but also younger folks because this was light and lively and also cut very effectively with a keen edge. So it was a little bit easier to use and the results were a little bit better than some of the other swords with more traditional geometries that had out on the table. Again, the edge was one thing that really aided there, but also uh, if you're not a big person, swinging a big sword around is it's tough to get that tip speed, especially if you're nervous and you want to be in control. So having something a little light helps you with that control. And the edge being really sharp, popping those noodles apart, I think was one of the reasons that uh, this sword was, was chosen quite a bit. Well, it was well, it was still in one piece. Uh, in terms of pushing it, so I, I used it quite a bit to, <laughs> to cut some harder targets, things that you wouldn't necessarily expect. I did cut some like cardboard tubes with it, I cut branches, I hit things with it, I slapped it on the side of the stand, I did, I did all manner of things. In that regard, in the sword, honestly, like it didn't dull in any meaningful or particular way. It didn't bend, and overall it held up well. And it wasn't until I started really doing stupid things with it that I noticed that it would diminish. Obviously, apart from apart from the, the pommel coming off, I was surprised that actually up until this point, everything still stayed on. Because when the pommel comes off or when the kashra comes off, usually these start to unravel and you have to tape them. I made no effort to secure it, and it held on and stayed together. Um, anyway throwing it at a tree. <laughs> that was one thing that damaged it. That's where it developed quite a bit of rattle and looseness. Um, I didn't notice any bending on the blade, but I did notice that the tip bent and deflected a little bit. It kind of canted over a little bit when it hit the ground once. Uh, there's rocks in the ground and that's likely what did it more than more than the dirt itself for the tree, but more or less it held up. It didn't bend, um, it didn't drastically deform after being thrown at a tree, and it was still overall a very usable weapon. It had a mildly bent cross guard, it had a little bit of rattle, and it had a slightly bent tip, but apart from that it was still raring to go after being tossed at a tree a number of times. From there I brought it to the Tree of Woe, which, bear in mind, is has broken other swords, though that was that was in the cold. Coming in the summer months, they we'll, we'll see how many break to the Tree of Woe, because I have a feeling it it's uh, <laughs> it's not aided by the by when I test them and it's it's below freezing. At the moment, though, I believe it was about 50 or 60 degrees outside while I was testing this sword, slapping it on the side of the tree. And what I'm expecting to see is exactly what happened. Uh, it took several strikes, but eventually I could get the sword to bend, and it wasn't springing back to shape, and it took a permanent set, one that I could likely get out, but it was canted off to one side a little bit, and that's exactly what it should do. It bent before it broke, and I did strike it on the tree pretty hard in a number of spots, and the sword didn't didn't break, which was the important piece. And other swords, again, on this, slapping it against the flat of the tree, have broken here. Uh, this one, this one did not. So from there, I brought it to the Croquet Stake of Doom and did one strike just to see how deeply it was it was gouging in. And it, it did take off some pretty meaty chunks with the Croquet Stake of Doom. Now, typically around uh, a millimeter would be a, a substantial amount. This is taking out a little bit more, maybe two millimeters in terms of depth, but it's a pretty thin edge. There's not a lot of niku on here. There's not a lot of meat behind the edge. So it's it's basically taking the blade back to where it's about a millimeter thick. And every time I strike, that's that's where it's kind of falling back or, or staying. If I hit in the same spot, it doesn't seem to take more off, maybe a little bit, but not, not really. And the depth seems to be about two millimeters, two and a half millimeters in terms of the parts that are rolling back or deflecting. It's not chipping off in big chunks. It's rolling back in chunks near so I can tell as I'm hitting the croquet stake. And several hardy strikes in the croquet stake of doom and it doesn't break. And this is again, great because I would say that if the, if the blade broke here, that'd be fine. Many blades don't make it to the Croquet Stake of Doom, so uh, it didn't break, and a lot of blades will, particularly also thinner blades or lighter blades like this, uh, when I slap them in the Croquet Stake of Doom, they, they take a few hits, but then after three or four, particularly as I get a little bit more confident and familiar and uh, really start throwing it out there with a little bit more authority, eventually they'll break. This one did not. I flipped it around to the spine, struck a few times, and that's, that's when it broke on the Croquet Stake. And that's exactly what I'm thinking should happen. Most of the time, Diminishing one side, flipping it around, striking around the back. That's a recipe to break the sword. It breaks most swords. Of course, if it didn't break, that'd be fantastic, but already I would say it exceeded my expectations in durability. The edge held up really well to doing some dumb stick cutting, to cutting harder targets. It didn't diminish in any meaningful way. Uh, and if it did, I could I could sharpen it, but it was still you know pretty much shaving sharp throughout the course of, <laughs> of using it on harder targets before I started tossing it at a tree. Uh, the damage from the tree was really minor. The damage from the, the tree of woe slapping it on the side of the tree, also very minor. And it took a number of strikes to hit the croquet stick of doom before, uh, before it eventually succumbed to failure. So 
that is all the damage that it took and what it took to get there. Uh, now I can give you my thoughts and if I personally think it's worth it or not. And in short, yes, but with a caveat. The, the Kashra coming off is still a, a bit of a deal breaker. It didn't. It came off pretty early in testing, and while the other bits of the sword, from, from there up, it exceeded my expectations, uh, this is really a downside and something that you know, is, is the main sour point on, on the sword. And even at 200 bucks or sub $200, $188, this really shouldn't come off. If you do decide to get one because you like uh, the other the other amenities that it has to offer, um, I may recommend putting some additional adhesive on here or getting some lacquer and spraying this down. And usually that helps keep the knots and all that kind of stuff tight. Or maybe we're even putting a couple dabs of super glue on the knots just because, again, that, that tends to help things hold down. Um, so that's really the, the main deterrent. If it weren't for that, it'd be an easy yes. Unfortunately, I, I would still say the Kasha coming off uh, would is, is a bit of a deal breaker here <laughs> in the sense that uh, if that's going to come off in normal use, uh, it's, it's, it's much harder to recommend. So I'd still say no, um, but only, only just and, and just specifically because of that. Um, at the same time, I can't lie in that there's a lot to be appreciated here for the money. You get a unique geometry, the Ito was tight, it held up really well, and this shows a ton of improvement from Romance of Men. I remember the first sword that I got from them had had a number of other issues than this did, and it's it's nice to see that the Ito has come a long way, uh, that the parts that they're using are, are holding up to, to trees, and that the, the blades they're making are, are pretty durable, well heat treated stuff. Um, so anyway, th this is the main thing. Um, but it is admittedly a minor thing, so if that doesn't bother you, or you're okay with putting a dab of glue, uh, or chancing it, or even just tying it back on, then the rest of the sword held up in, in a great way. Anyway, uh, that's what I have to share with you. Hopefully it's been helpful. Thanks again to Romance of Men for sending this my way, and cheers, and thanks for watching.